I have to welcome you, everyone. Thank you very much for attending the second part of the International Research Network called ASEAN China Norms. Uh, today, the seminar is uh, related to the China's economic rise and its uh, new social norms in Southeast Asia that it could come from uh, China or maybe circulating be between the two areas or um, um, so we will see uh, what happened because of this economic rise, which has a lot of effect beyond and much beyond the economic uh, dimensions. Uh, last week, we had um, a, a fantastic lecture for, from Professor Wang Gunvu, a lecture that will be commented today by Robert Boyer, uh, a great economist from France. Um, that is studying the diversity of ASEAN capitalism from more than uh, 15, 20 years. Robert Boyer has worked a lot on Japan first, and then he paid attention to China and now is interested also in the regional integration process. But as Professor Boyer is, uh, needs time to, to join, I suggest that we, we, we start maybe with a uh, a first uh, lecture on the ASEAN's response to China's economic policy uncertainty with uh, Hui from USM Penang. Before Hui starts, Hui, would you be ready to start? Yes, I am. Okay, okay thank you. So before Hui is uh, starting, I will just explain you how, to, how we structured the, the day. First, we focus more on investment uh, in, in, from China to Southeast Asia, with a, a, a general view uh, following what we pre presented last week with Minhua, and uh, we, we have a view first, a general view from, from Hui, then a Vietnamese view from Ha, from the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences. In the second part of the first um, session, will be um, focusing on sectors and on the political economy of the negotiation and the relations that um, China is um, opening with the local authorities uh, concerning this investment. So first it will be Malaysian Railway, the ECRL, and then uh, Chinese dams in Mali and Renewable Energy Project in Malaysia and Cambodia compared by Antonin Morin. Afternoon, no, not so, sorry. Second part of the seminar will be looked at the different normative uh, influence that China has or my, might have in the region. And we will go through different dimensions of the topic. One is the normative, um, the urban norms with Aze Esposito, uh, urbanist and geographer from CNRS. Then the internationalization of the university, so it's more higher education. And the impact of China will be presented by Jimmy Steff. Then um, there are um, normative effects from China on, uh, um, we could say political norms and the, freedom of association will be an example taken from Vietnam with Ziang Nguyen from Hanoi um, comparing the models, um, competing models of, from China and Europe and especially France in the draft law of association in Vietnam. And finally, Laure Siegel, which is an independent journalist, uh, will present, us, present to us the new risk for the media in Southeast Asia and she will try to assess whether uh, China is playing a role or which, which kind and or not so much in, in this topic. So the normative issues will be more in the second part. And first we start with um, uh, more strictly economic uh, dimension in the, um, in the line we were already opening uh, last week. So, I think now we, we can we can start. And who it's it's your turn. Um, bonjour, Madame Van Ha. Ha, hello. I greet you all, and we have to to start. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm the um, 
Hello, Bert. Uh, I'm the chairman. I'm the moderator. So when I have to tell you it's time, we please uh, you you go to the conclusion. So I just greet Muriel, and now I, I'm I'm ready. I'm done. Merci. Okay, so let me start now. Huh? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. The floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, share my screen. Okay. Uh, so I believe you can see the screen clearly. Perfect. And, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Okay, so uh, my name is Kui Fui. I'm Kui Fui Lin from University of Science Malaysia. They're located in Penang. So uh, thank you, Elsa, uh, for inviting me to join this workshop and uh, share some of my work that uh, I recently done with my two co-authors, Osama and Kimberly from American University of Sharjah. Okay. So the topic of uh, this presentation is uh, we are trying to look at the impact of uh, Chinese economic policy uncertainty on ASEAN stock markets. Okay, uh, so in fact, uh, we are still ongoing of uh, this uh, project or this research. So uh, this is, we share some of our preliminary um, results with uh, everyone and hope to get some comments from you all. Okay, next. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we can see that uh, many countries are trapped in what appears to be a messy divorce between the US and China, where neither party has the money to buy out the other share of the house. Okay, and we also can see that uh, Chinese economics policy remains a mystery and somewhat of a threat to many nations in Southeast Asia. It, uh, because Chinese uh, long-term political and economic transitions uh, involve uh, a lot of uh, significant uncertainty. Okay. And also on the other hand, we also understand that the performance of uh, stock market is highly reliant on the government's economics policy. And in terms of ASEAN and the relationship between China and ASEAN, we know also uh, the trade with China is significant and growing in the many of the ASEAN member countries. Okay, so therefore we will think that uh, China's EPU, okay, so the EPU stand for the uh, economic policy uncertainty, should have some potential impact on the stock market in the ASEAN member nations more profoundly than the, the other advanced economies. Okay, because the China ASEAN relationship has evolved into the region most successfully and vibrant cooperation model, as well as a commendable effort to build a community with a shared future that can benefit the citizen of the region. And also we understand that ASEAN has been a significant recipients of uh, Chinese FDI inflows over the year. Okay, like for example, since 2015, there has been a remarkable growth in the flow of Chinese FDI into the regions. And China has been the eighth largest portfolio investor as well to ASEAN with an average of 6.87 billion for the period of 2010 to 2016. On the other hand, China is also one of the largest recipients of ASEAN portfolio investments with an average of 77 billion for the same period. Okay. And given that the Chinese uh, OBOI initiative <clears throat> China represents an alternative for the ASEAN country to build a trading and investment relationship. And at the same time, there has been ongoing back and forth conflict between the US and China regarding trade between the two countries. So we can also see that uh, 
uh, we also involve this uh, U.S. Uh, in the study because uh, we believe that the U.S. political and economic policy toward ASEAN states is also has the impact, but then the, the impacts will be inconsistent. So therefore, we ask that uh, how has the uncertainty about these economics and statecraft decision impacted ASEAN stock exchanges? And therefore, we try to use this economic policy uncertainty to answer these important questions. Uh, some empirical study have uh, found that uh, neighboring countries such as Malaysia are more integrated with China if compared to the US and the Japan. Okay, so therefore, uh, this paper we try to examine whether the change of the Chinese and as well as the American economics policy uncertainty have the impacts on the stock market return of the ASEAN stock exchange and in particular we choose um, six uh, ASEAN stock exchange. Yeah? Okay, so the, the six will be uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand as well as uh, Vietnam. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, give some idea of uh, what is EPU, economic policy uncertainty. Uh, economic policy uncertainty refers to the inability of market participants to anticipate political and economic decisions made by state. The measure is broad and includes uncertainty regarding geopolitical events that have an impact on economic conditions. Okay. Uh, policy uncertainty is associated with unanticipated changes that affect the economic environment and has a significant negative effect on economic activity. In terms of investors, the investors are likely to become more pessimistic when uncertainty rises as they tend to respond to the bad news. But ignore the good news. Okay, so uh, here these are the three research questions we are trying to ask. That uh, the first one is how the Chinese EPU affect the uh, six ASEAN stock markets. Uh, examine over the periods of the times that in our study. The second question will be is the impact of this uh, Chinese EPU homogeneous across these six uh, stock exchanges in ASEAN. And question number three is uh. How does the One Belt, One Road initiative impact the relationship of this, which means uh, between the Chinese EPU and the stock exchange in the six ASEAN market? Okay, so uh, basically, this is the methodology. So I will now go through in detail. Uh, the sample period that we are looking for uh, is between January 1995 to June 2020. We are using the monthly uh, return. Huh? So uh, this is the, the model that we use that where uh, RT is referred to the monthly stock market return in month T. And then uh, we have uh, EPU China and EPU US, which is uh, we take the changes of the economic policy uncertainty index of the China and US respectively. We also include the Shanghai Stock Exchange returns, market returns uh, into the model and as well as uh, we consider COVID into the case, uh, into the model also since uh, this is uh, the period, especially in the period of uh, 2020. Okay, so therefore uh, in general, this is the model and we just use the standard uh, GACH 11's model to do our estimations, which is the standard uh, modeling estimations uh, in finance when we deal with the stock market. And, uh, I just present some of my brief results on this. Uh, in general, that uh, we find that the six ASEAN countries stock return are negatively affected by the policy uncertainty in general. And however, the impact of the EPO varies by country. 
for example, we find that uh, Chinese EPO has the highest effect on stock indexes in Indonesia and the lowest in Malaysia. Whereas the impact, if we compare the impacts of the Chinese EPU in Indonesia and Thailand, the Indonesia have a greater impact than China. And the US EPU has the greatest impact in Philippines, followed by Singapore and Thailand. The impacts of US EPU on ASEAN markets have fallen over time with the inconsistency over the TPP and the Trump administration's uh, tantrums over China. And the Shanghai stock market return has a statistically significant positive influence on the stock market return in all the six ASEAN countries. Okay, which this can give an intuitive that uh, perhaps the financial spillovers from China to the regional market are increasing. And the number of the COVID-19 cases negatively affect the stock market return in all the six countries, okay, which we believe that uh, it's true that the COVID-19 pandemic adds to the global uncertainty and causing the stock investors to be fearful and pessimistic about the future returns. Also, uh, in terms of the Beirut Initiative, the impact of uh, the Beirut Initiative, right? So, uh, we do the same estimation, but uh, we are taking the just look at the subsample from March 2015 to June 2020. Okay, and we find that uh, there's some impact on this that where uh, the Chinese EPU negatively affect the stock market return in Indonesia and Malaysia in this subsequent period. Uh, this could be uh, show that the implementations of the BOR has increased the extent of the impact of China's EPU on the ASEAN equity markets. Specifically, if you look at the size of the, the impact, it, it increased from uh, 0 0.02 to 5 in during the full sample period and compared with the 0 0.0361 in the sub-sample period. So therefore, we may say that uh, China's influence over the ASEAN region is growing in part because it brings uh, external governance to these countries. And the economic and financial integration between Malaysia and China also became stronger following the uh, Belarus Initiative. Okay, uh, so in conclusion, that our findings suggest that the ASEAN 6 stock market dynamics and China and the US economic policy condition are strongly interconnected. So indeed, the stock market participants and investors in these six countries should observe the Chinese and American economic policy condition before making their investment decisions. And as for the policy maker, perhaps they should consider the impact of their action and have on the financial markets and the livelihood of the peoples in the country that are impacted by policy decisions and the trade disputes. Okay, with that, thank you for your patience. That's all. Stop my sharing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this uh, very sophisticated analysis of the um, financial integration between the um, China and the Southeast Asian countries. Um, that is completing the economic uh, dimension of the integration we presented last, last week and we will continue to develop today. And we are interested to learn that the BRI has a multiplier effect on um, the, the, the financial integration in the region. Um, now, Robert Boyer has joined us. Maybe there is something doing noise. Maybe the mic must be cut and we will listen to Professor Boyer. Okay, it is my pleasure to react to two wonderful conference by Professor Wang. Uh, I will try to organize my present, brief presentation on two issues. 
first uh, he mentioned uh, how dependent are capitalism grants from political and national objectives. So I will deal about capitalism diversity and then I will inverse his presentation and try to analyze what are the consequences. Is it easy or not to integrate if the region is very diverse? Why uh, capitalism are so uh, diverse? Because by definition, capitalism is in permanent flux of transformation, both by institutional and uh, technological innovation. From a very technical point of view, many mechanisms explain why you don't have the same brand of capitalism. First, you have imperfect information, you see every day, increasing return to scurrying, co-evolution of technology and institution, and of course, path and history dependency, and last and not least, the role of polity in the emergence of most economic institutions. If you follow this analysis, then uh, economists should uh, observe that basically they tend to analyze, especially market as a voluntary horizontal mechanism of coordination. But please remember that you are also the firm, vitally, uh, vertically integrated. You have obligation by state uh, action uh, and uh, spending and taxation. You have community and civil society. And of course, you have very fashionable association and networks. Very good. If you adapt this multi-scala uh, conception of coordinating mechanism, you can define the, the various brand of capitalism. I will only state some of them. Imagine you have state, market, civil society, and firm. Let's go to the French case, a, a wonderful example of mixed capitalism. Let's go to Japan or Korea. Collective capitalism, the same fact, all the upon the time, state and firms used to collaborate. Uh, let's go to, um, uh, 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 to um, uh, third Italy and industrial district. You have a wonderful cooperation between state and civil society and so on. So the, the very, uh, of course, you have family capitalism with many economies. So, Basically, uh, the rule is diversity of capitalism by the variety. A very old, since decades, regulation theory has been investigating among developers in the country. And we found when you have a problem, how do you react? If you go to US and UK, you get, let's have a market and the regulatory agency. Let's go to Japan and Korea. Let's try to try to integrate into conglomerate, k uh, or Chebol, the internal um, adaptation required by innovation. Let's go to state-led e economies. If the central state as in France or the land as in Germany, then let us have state try to coordinate education, research, access to credit. And let's go to Scandinavian country. You have a problem. Let's try social partners, design a new institution. And the best example is the so-called Danish flex security. So you understand the huge variety. And this is what is very important, my dear colleagues, Inori uh, 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 and Yuji and uh, Arada have been plugging in uh, automatic data clustering, uh, uh, the, not only OECD country, that was the case of the, the previous dia uh, diagram, but uh, with Asia and with two variables, horizontal one, the degree of, rig of constraint of price formation and the freedom, then on the other side, you have the str strong state dependence, the external trade dependence, or you have strong regulation of labor markets. And as you might see, you have the free form of capitalism. You have meso cooperative capitalists, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And you have, you see, Singapore and Hong Kong, definitely uh, different, different branch. Uh, Malaysia, Thailand uh, and China belong to another side, and uh, you have Indonesia and Philippines. So it, clearly with Israel, and observe the big discrepancy of this form of capital. And third result, very important, if you compare from one decade to another one, nobody is converging toward a single best way. You have a still a strong specificity. Each capitalism is, for example, opening to innovation, to some form, of some form of derivation, but basically they stay within the same region. So clearly, historic, historic matter. 
what is the problem with uh, financialization and uh, uh, opening to world competition? You have three criteria to assess the merits and the weakness of values capitalism. The first one is short-run flexibility. This is the standard neoclassical model. Remember that in the 40s era, it was dynamic efficiency, the ability to improve productivity and standard of living. And last but not least, you have equity. These institutions have to be uh, legitimized by the, uh, by the feeling by population that they are fairly, uh, that they fair, tra fair treatment. If you look at the danger of deregulation and internal competition is move of deregulations to uh, the short run flexibility in the sense that if you are slow to act, it was the case, for example, of Japan or Korea, you will be uh, overgrown by the short run flexibility uh, typical of American capitalism. So the, the, the issue was, will capitalism react, uh, resist? And here it is a kind of uh, a tribute to Karl Poyani. Because if you look carefully, uh, uh, you can imagine that spontaneously, capitalism without any political control will destroy nature, will destroy money in the sense of privatization of money, for example, by crypto money, and finally convert labor into a typical commodity with all the problems about inequality and misery. So uh, the basic interpretation of regulation, if states and democratic process are strong enough, they can impose a concept of justice, uh, direction for the national system of innovation, tame capital market in order to embed long-term view and not only short-term You have to organize training and education to have a high value added industries. And of course, you have to organize industrial relations in order to try to solve peacefully the capital level uh, uh, conflicts. And it's, if you do so, maybe you have some form of capitalism much more efficient than the uh, norm, that the typical American capitalism. This example would be the so-called German economy with social market economy, social in the sense society is embedding capitalism and then firms have to adapt and they can become very competitive. So the, the end of the message is clearly on this side, diversity is here to last and some political constraints are very important to be done. Let me turn to the first part of Professor Juan Israel, capitalism, uh, diversity, and regional integration. As you pointed out, uh, the big um, the weakness of most standard neoclassical economy is they start from today uh, without any historical retrospect. That history matter, and I will try to show uh, uh, how. And of course, second mechanism, so you have an inertia factor. But remember that capitalism is among the most innovative um, socioeconomic regime ever invented. In, in, in the sense that, observe the speed of uh, invention of vaccines uh, in order to fight uh, against COVID. So in the sense, clearly you have a, a, a duality, inertia of the choice, but clear. And in this context, regional integration is a learning process. And you are, in a sense, as the previous uh, presentation pointed out, you have to reduce uncertainty by having collective rules in order to prevent. And again, you have so many forms of regional integration. At the very strict beginning, it's only a, a, a question of uh, international trade and free trade. But as soon as you organize common external tariffs, capital labor mobility, um, homogenization of taxation, of subsidy, of credits, and so on, you go from free trade zone to economic union and federalism. So again, when you, uh, you have very uh, nice federalist study by my colleague Bruno Terry, comparing that the federalism in Canada, in Germany, and in US, and in Argentina are not the same. So clearly why? Because we have totally different uh, embeddedness of these institutions into the political arena. Let's review quickly European integration. What is very interesting, it is it, it has been taking six decades. And what has been very interesting is a permanent deepening and extension. At the very beginning, you have only a very limited country, six of them. And then progressive by attractiveness of the um, large market, you have an arrangement, but simultaneously you have deepening. 
And one very important decision has been to launch the euro. If we want to, to have fair competition, you cannot allow competitive devaluation due to um, national macroeconomic imbalance. And therefore, you create the euro. And at this stage, so, a, a large part of European countries do not uh, want to belong to the euro, and they continue to, to be part of the eurozone, but not of the uh, euro. And then you have a multi-level organization. What is very surprising with this model, it is that it is based on crisis. Why? You can interpret all the history as a response to crisis. Europeans, after the Second War, they want uh, to avoid absolutely is another world conflict generated by French and German rivalry. So they, they decided to integrate some markets to extend them from the coal and steel to a, 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 a common zone. Then with a financial deregulation and the flexibility of exchange, you have big unbalance due to the fact that exchange rate do not correspond to relative competition. You had to invent the monetary stability and, and the third open, was just creating a new goods, you know, and then given this, what was missing when the 2008 crisis, great financial crisis opened, we did not have financial stability. And if I prolonged this diagram, with the COVID, we realized that uh, healthcare was not uh, concern for Europe, but you have to decide first, common industrial policy in order to get vaccine, and second, joint um, uh, reflation plan in order to prevent a cumulative depression. So you understand clearly that what is very puzzling in the present period, will the COVID crisis be the next stage of an integration, or is it the proof that uh, this uh, uh, configuration cannot exist anymore and we can uh, we necessarily have to go to a more federal state. If I look at the ASEAN, it's much longer because clear and you have a much more um, in the case of uh, France, uh, of uh, European integration, you begin with institutions. What impressed me looking comparatively is that you have a very step-by-step uh, -step learning process in which you try to integrate various form very slowly with modest and uh, uh, what, what, what was the funding uh, blocks of Europe uh, derived from a, a longer process of evolution and you have a permanent adjustment not only to external financial crisis for example the major role of the ASEAN crisis of 97 but also to the reaction of the world economy and what is very impressive for me here is the ASEAN economic integration, and you have two evolutions. The world economy, which is, in a sense, allowing integration by export-led strategy, but also generating huge instability due to the instability of the international financial system. And the other side, you have inter international organizations which have been helping in promoting multilateral trade before uh, previous um, uh, American trade. And what is very important for me is that clearly, you are um, now in a better position given that your institutions are now adapted uh, to uh, preventing the repetition of uh, financial crisis. I remember that Asia went very well in the, Asian, uh, uh, the new crisis, uh, financial crisis in 2008. And second, you, uh, you have been observing incredible efficiency in fighting against the COVID. So clearly, uh, this is a question. And how should I conclude? This was the conclusion of a book I edited with my Chinese and Japanese colleagues. First, capitalist diversity is not eroded by globalization, it's here to stay. Second, and this is a very dialectical, structural limits of globalization makes integration attractive. For example, uh, when uh, President Trump decided uh, America first, you had a kind of cohesive movement within Europe. We will go alone without the US. So first element, if uh, uh, multilateral is failing, you can turn to regional integration. And what is second attraction of integration, maybe it could be uh, a step in order for negotiating a, an over international regime. 
it cannot, uh, all, all the two, uh, 250 countries are difficult to, to, um, to bargain. They have to organize regionally and then to try to defend their collective interests in building the pillar of a new international regime. And if uh, it is a very short summary, I cannot demonstrate it, two successful uh, conditions for uh, uh, success of integration, comparing as Asia and Europe. First, limited size and power difference. In the case of Europe, all the countries were bankrupt by the devastation of war. So it was a kind of everybody was equally poor uh, and desperate to, to build again. So limited size and power differences as a precondition for supranational institution building. The second element, and it is the case for Europe, if you adopt uh, a common currency, i.e. you put a break on adjustment by exchange rate, then you need a form of fiscal solidarity. And you will understand all the uncertainty of the present time. Will the June uh, 2020 pact in which uh, European will spend uh, 750 uh, billion euro to help uh, on, a, on a solidaristic way in order to overcome the, is it a, an exception or is it the starting point of federalism? And you understand our history master. So let me put some references. First, a, a first book with my colleagues uh, um, um, uh, on the diversity and transformation of the capital. And more recently, uh, Elsa and a colleague of mine, Pierre, are reading a book on capitalism, ASEAN capitalism. And, and the most recent book I've been summarizing is on evolving diversity and interdependence of capitalism. So thank you so much, Professor Wang. You have been stimulating very much my own thinking. I'll be very delighted to try to cooperate again with you uh, in the future. Merci beaucoup, cher Robert. Thank you very much. Um, we have to, unfortunately, to, to shift to the next presentation. And I, I know that already uh, in Q&A, there will be questions to your analysis. Thank you very, very much. And the cooperation between the CNRS and NUS at the East Asian Institute is uh, on, on the way, and Professor Wong and Professor well, yeah, we will work together in the in the next month. We are very happy of it. So please, Ha from the Vietnam Academy of Social Sciences, we are waiting for your presentation on Chinese investment in Vietnam, new trends, industrial issues. I thank you very much. If you are ready, you have to share your screen and and please, we listen to you. The presentation is very simple. I I would like to. Uh, to provide to all of you very uh, brief picture of China investment in Vietnam. Okay, as you know, uh, China stepped up uh, her investment in uh, 1999 because with the going global strategy. So it is a very effective strategy for China to accept with the country where China can explore the Im and import the raw material and fuel for her manufacturing sector. Uh, but after the 18th Communist Party National Congress of China in 2012, the Chinese government are looking for new impetus from abroad to improve the quality, efficiency, and competitiveness economy and such as the uh, opening of the border, implement policy and inclusive model for economic cooperation, transportation and cross-border payment, infrastructure connection, as we know is the Belt and Road Initiative. On the other hand, China has been increased her own to the global economy effort to build a new economic order. So this is directly impact to Vietnam and China economic relation in general and China investment in Vietnam in particular. Next slide, please. 
Yes, but uh, my computer just stopped. Wait a minute, let me share again. Uh, I don't know what it cannot move now. <laughs> okay, so I can talk, yeah. So is, is the slide not moving? Uh, let me try again. Okay, let me just do this way. Yeah, okay. The next one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, China is recently, the uh, China ODIs is uh, developed very quickly. Uh, in 2012, China had risen to the world's third largest outward direct investment with a total investment about 87 billion US dollars, and be, that behind the United States and Japan. But in uh, 2015, for the first time, China became the second largest outward investment just behind the United States. Okay, you can see in the, the figure here, and especially after the China carry out the BII initiative, the outward investment from China to the outside increase. I collected the data from China, and we can see in the among the ten uh, countries along belong to the BRI uh, initiatives. Uh, Vietnam is the uh, ranking is number five in ten countries get the uh, uh, investment from China. Uh, the investment methods and sector that China is uh, invest to the outside. Recently, uh, we can see the m and is uh, take a high promotion from China. So this way, the big firm of China, uh, like the China Chemical, Hire or Media, they can get the, uh, the, um, the patent and the research capacity took an advantage. For the investment in the country with along the Bell and Road Initiative, is the, they focus mainly in energy and infrastructure construction. And Chinese firm has gradually increased their capability when doing business overseas. Next slide, please. For the Vietnam, uh, the trends of Chinese outward investment uh, to the outside in Vietnam is similarity. Uh, I divide to the two phase. The first phase is from 1991 in 2000. If that's behind, um, after the Vietnam and China uh, becomes a normalization relation. And the first one is a joint venture between Vietnam a company and a China company is a restaurant in Hanoi. So in the first 10 years, the growth rate of investment capital is low. The scale of small projects is only 1.5 million US dollars per project. And the investment sector is mainly is light industries and consumption production. Next slide, please. Okay. From 2000 and 2014, I think that the trend is uh, similar to the 2000 and uh, to, to one, uh, 1991 and 2000. And uh, China is in investment is still limited in Vietnam. Next slide, please. But when I research more after the China, they carry out the BI initiative from 2014 and 2019, the investment from China to Vietnam increased significantly. Uh, you can see in the, in the figure here, especially in 2019, 
the investment from China to Vietnam increased dramatically. Uh, it's because of the trade war between uh, China and US. And Vietnam is the, China is the first, uh, the biggest trading partner of Vietnam. Vietnam mainly imports the raw material and uh, manufacture uh, input from China. And after that, we export to the US and EU. So when the, the trade war uh, um, happened, uh, a lot of China investors, they come, they come to the Vietnam and invest more in Vietnam. And after that, the product can export to the uh, developed countries like US or EU. Next slide, please. Uh, if we look at the table uh, in 2020, and China now moved to the uh, number three, if we uh, combine the data from the China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, it's a big number. That's only uh, after the Singapore. Next table, please. Next slide, please. If we um, take the measure on the stock finger, at the moment, China is the number seven among more than 120 investor a partner of Vietnam, with a total capital is about more than 18 billion US dollars and three more than 3,000 projects. Next slide, please. Yeah. In terms of investment sector, manufacturing and processing industries get the largest investment from China. Around more than 250 projects with more than 2,000, uh, 2.6 billion US dollars. But for the manufacturing sector, it's mainly in the textile and garment industries. Next slide, please. I, hear, uh, I give here uh, is the big projects that we get the investment from China. And it's mainly, first one is the energy sector. For example, Vinton One Thermal Power Plant in Vinton Province of Vietnam get the more than 1 billion uh, 1.57 billion US dollars. And another sector get the last investment from China is the textile and garment production. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much, Ha. Maybe you have to conclude uh, quickly. Uh, okay, now. yeah. Two minutes, but no more. Thank you. Okay, I, I will conclude my presentation. Uh, yeah, um, uh, we can see the new trend of investment from China uh, in Vietnam recently, especially in five years recently. Uh, I, I have some uh, conclusions about the challenge and opportunity in terms of Viet, uh, China investment in Vietnam. At the moment, uh, Vietnam uh, side has 14 FTA, and Vietnam become one of open economy in the world. Uh, with the foreign trade, we account for 200% of GDP, and we rely on the China uh, uh, trade with account for 40% of GDP. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, uh, China, China investment in Vietnam is heading to a new area. And um, the Chinese investor now, they have aware that we, Vietnam is requires more uh, quality of the investment projects. And they, they try to change the, the strategy with the high products and high quality of investment go to Vietnam recently. As you know, China is a very large 
economy and only maintain the growth in 2020 when the COVID-19 outbreak. In the coming time, when China, they issue the 14 five-year plan and they focus on more science and technology and innovation. It uh, gives the Vietnam both the challenge and, actually, uh, and uh, opportunity. The challenge is that uh, maybe more, you know, uh, outdated low projects um, when go to the outside and Vietnam is become, become one a place of a Chinese investor. Another challenge, another opportunity that China they, they carry out the newer circulation economy and Vietnam will become one of the country playing an important role in China external cycle. So it's also our opportunity if we can get it. Another factor that trade war between the United States and China now still not, you know, and yet. So it gives the Vietnam, it uh, a, a, a challenge that uh, some, you know, investor from China, they go to invest in Vietnam to transcend, transcend uh, transshipment trans point of good from China I can export to, to the US. So uh, if we cannot get a good, you know, uh, post licensing inspection and supervision of FDI project from China, maybe uh, it's not good for Vietnam to get, you know, the effective project. Uh, so in the future, Vietnam should uh, promote economic institutional reform, improve the capacity of Vietnam enterprise, improve the quality of human resource, and we need to strengthen the post licensing and inspection and supervision of China uh, investment project. That ends in my uh, presentation, and thank you for listening. I'm very sorry about the technical problem. Don't be sorry. We are very happy to listen to, yeah. to this fine presentation on the investment in Vietnam. It's, it is precising the overview that Minua has been proposing last week. Uh, but uh, we have now to, to go to one um, specific investment from China in the in Malaysia now, it will be the East Coast Railway uh, construction and renegotiation. Uh, Chung Yi from the University of Nottingham uh, will present it now. Thank you, Chung Yi. Chung Yi, sorry, to, to, yeah. for doing it now. Thank you. Please. Thank you all for um, inviting us of this um, very meaningful virtual conference. And uh, um, I think now you could see my screen. Yeah. No. Not yet. yet. No. Not yet. Okay. You, Sorry. Yeah. Excuse me. We are a bit short of time, so try to be a bit shorter than a bit longer, if possible. Thank you. We try our best. <laughs> we all. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. have. Uh, uh, but we 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 hope that we will be able to finish in uh, fifteen minutes, as we uh, aside to. So Perfect. I would think that you are able to see my slides and I will make it as a display mode. Yeah, good. So thank you once more for inviting us. And uh, uh, I'm very honored to work with my two colleagues in um, Department of Political Science International Islamic University in Malaysia, May and Zui. Um, my name is Trini Lee. I'm from the UK campus, University of Nottingham. So what we would like to discuss or present our ongoing um, uh, research is about China's infrastructure diplomacy. It's about China's infrastructure diplomacy specifically in Malaysia. And as you see that our title is about can a mouse leave that elephant? So what we are essentially discussed is about China's infrastructure investments on Malaysia's ECRL. So to start with, why do we look into um, China's infrastructure investment as a whole in Malaysia? 
because sorry, as a whole in the region in Southeast Asia, because we've noticed that uh, the Jakarta Bandung High Speed Railway was already uh, started, and uh, it was a high speed railway linked uh, in the capital of Indonesia, Jakarta to Bandung, the test hub in Indonesia as well. The railway itself is about 150 kilometer and it's a high speed railway because the speed is between 200 and 250 kilometer per hour. So the construction of this high speed railway in Malaysia started in 2016, supposedly to finish the project in 2021. However, due to the pandemic impact, it might be a bit delayed. The total budget is about 6.7 billion US dollars. The second, uh, even longer high-speed railway, of course, and more into the interest of both geographic scholar, scholars in geography and also for us, political economy uh, scholars and students, is China-Thailand high-speed railway. This high-speed railway is between Chinese city of Kunming in Yunnan province and Thai capital Bangkok. It's run through Laos and expected to carry a high speed of 250 km per hour by 2026 to finish the whole project. And as just we were doing the research uh, on the way to prepare the presentation and paper writing up, we've noticed that this high speed railway between China and Thailand, the first phase, phase one, has just signed the contract on March, March 30th this year, just last month actually. The first phase, phase one is 5.85 billion. We need to emphasize that's a phase two. So the total budget certainly will be even bigger. The reason that we came to our case, Malaysia East Coast Railway, because with all this railway, as we've seen, of uh, Chinese investment in the specific country, Indonesia, all across country, China, Thailand, high-speed railway, the Malaysia East Coast Railway was easily the only one so far has been renegotiated. So the agreement with Niger government in 2018 was about the price of 15.6 billion US dollars. After changing the government in 2018, the renegotiation started in 19, uh, 2019 and the budget brought down to 10.3 billion. So here comes to our questions. Um, we were arguing and to see whether Chinese infrastructure diplomacy as a novel, a new diplomacy other than existing economic diplomacy which we've discussed in our paper, but we probably wouldn't be able to really go into details to answer this question in this short time presentation. However, what we wanted to present in this presentation is who are the actors to negotiate and renegotiate the ECRL? And would be possible to see Malaysia as a successful case to indicate the recipient countries of the whole China's infrastructure diplomacy would have a leverage to negotiate with China. So far of the China ASEAN research seminar we've listened to till now this point is an overall perspective of China's FDI or impact on stock market. But our case is just to indicate from a specific investment on an individual country, Malaysia, to see whether the recipients would be able to leverage or to renegotiate, actually it did. And we wanted to analyze why and how. So what we wanted to also to sort of unpack China as an investor and recipient country, in our case, Malaysia is, both sides are not one actor. And this is what we think is a little bit different from so far the presentation we've learned from this research seminar. Because actually, if we took what we uh, had adopted, the analytical uh, method, it's not a framework because we, we still think this is a good method, but it's not a framework as a whole. We took the actor network theory, which was uh, established by a French uh, um, good scholar, Latou in 1996. 
And uh, the two defined the actor at home is something that acts or granted by other activities. So all these negotiations or renegotiation or investment actually are motivated or coordinated by different actors. So we wanted to see how and why different actors, for what reasons to be motivated and to pursue certain activities and outcome. What we wanted, what we've already noticed in the existing literature is from the China side, it's not only one actor because the Chinese government's interest, which would be able actually to def deviate between uh, central government and local government. And also it's not necessarily coincide with the state owned enterprises interest. How do they reconcile? This is what we wanted to find out more so we also realized that Malaysia is not only one actor, the recipient country. Malaysia government interest and the same, well, the counterpart of the state-owned enterprises, which in Malaysia's government-linked companies' interests are not necessarily the same, but they somehow reconcile and coincide with each other and complement with each other, each other to pursue the same outcome. How did that happen? So what I will proceed, we will proceed now is to pass to May to explain what in our case of study, what is East uh, ECRL. So the East Code Rail Link, May please. Thank you so much, Junyi. So uh, I'm going to just uh, give you an overview about what is this project. So um, ECRL is called East Coast Rail Link. So what is it about? It's actually a, not a high speed rail. There are reports saying that this is high speed, but this is actually not high speed, which I want to highlight here. And it's basically meant to actually link East and West Coast. So uh, it's not only for passengers, but it is also for uh, goods as well, transportation of goods. Uh, the purpose is actually to really to connect the port in the East, East Coast and the West Coast. So more of the uh, transportation was meant towards uh, cargo. And again, I want to emphasize here that this is not an FDI because this is at most a local investment which, uh, in which Malaysian government actually took loan from Exim Bank, China. So there were many expected benefits at the start when the government proposed this project. So the fundamental one that the government say is to close the development gap between the East and the West Coast. So, East is um, historically will very, uh, is, is still uh, very much less developed compared to the West Coast. And later on, you can see the map where is East, where is Coast, uh, where is East and where is West. And not only that, uh, it, it allows um, job creations. It were expected that uh, due to this project, this is the last investment by government. They were expected to create a lot of job, jobs, trainings, by these, uh, also by um, CCCC, which is one of the, uh, which is the main conductor for this uh, project. And not only that, it's going to ease the transportation of goods and people. So now people can actually easily go to West Coast from East Coast um, and it with reduced time, right? And also the goods as well. And most importantly, the government uh, also said that there will be technology transfer from China to Malaysia, uh, especially when um, there is um, sort of like trainings from this um, um, CCCC uh, um, for Malaysian's talent, uh, as, as well as they're, when they're doing some um, civil works, they will be coordinating with the uh, Chinese constructor called uh, Chinese uh, uh, CCCC. So it's with the hope that there will be technology transfer. So this is the map of Malaysia. So if you look at uh, the West Coast, which is like Perak, Selangor, um, and then uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, these are much more developed comparatively to the West Coast. Uh, the West Coast would be Terengganu, Kelantan, and Pahang. So you, you know that this, uh, project is called East Coast Railing, right? Because the next um, the next uh, picture will show you that. 
most of the rail will will be connecting the east part, eastern part, uh, east coast of Malaysia. So uh, here you have two different alignments, as you can see in red and gray color. The the one in uh, gray color is actually the first alignment proposed by Malaysian government. So after that, because there is a change of government, um, they propose another new uh, uh, alignment. But however, you see everything is quite the same until uh, towards the end where there's a split. So this alignment under the first uh, uh, government under Najib, they go towards the north. Uh, but this um, the one from the second uh, pH plan, they go for the southern, southern alignment. So that's the difference. So uh, as we shall see next, so before 2018 general elections, the government in Malaysia is Barisan National. So this Barisan National uh, was under Najib Razak, which was the prime minister and also finance minister. He has this idea to actually um, close the development gap between both sides, right? So he, he talked to the cabinet about this project. And after that, uh, the Chinese government get to know that the interests of the Malaysian government. So they offer not only in terms of expertise to build the railway, but also in terms of loan. So therefore, uh, you can see the main con uh, the main uh, companies that will be doing this um, uh, real, real, real link is uh, China Communication Construction Company, CCCC. So you can see that there is one actor here, which is called Jolo. So, there was no mention of this guy. He was a businessman and also an unofficial advisor to Najib Raza back then. But uh, during a court trial for uh, one of the Malaysia uh, bribery cases, um, the witness said that you know, Joe Lo was actually responsible to negotiate this ECRL. So we would say that he's one of the important actor in this first negotiation, as, apart from Malaysian government, China government, and CCCC. And the next negotiation, we saw that uh, in 2018, it was the first time that Malaysia uh, had a change of government. So for the past more than 60 years, uh, the government had been uh, Barisan National, but this time around 2018, we had a new government, which is called Pakatan Harapan. So due this new government, when they were elected, they think that all the projects by the previous government were fraudulent. They think the price was too um, like inflated. So they wanted to renegotiate and they bring this case to China. Before they actually asked for renegotiation, they wanted to cancel it. But there was a clause in the uh, contract which says that if you cancel that, uh, they have to pay a lot. A huge sum. So therefore, Malaysia insists on renegotiation and surprisingly, China actually agreed to this one. And that's the reason why we, need, we want to find out. Um, so the renegotiation is uh, under Malaysia government uh, when Mahathir was the prime minister. And he actually didn't ask any of the uh, ministers to hit the negotiation. Instead, he asked uh, Tun Daim, he was the advisor to the government. So uh, to hit the whole task force. So Tun Daim would then pick his own people, his special task force from uh, the uh, various uh, government agencies and departments to go with him for the negotiation. So, uh, and that negotiation, May, pardon? May, you have one minute to conclude now. Okay. Sorry so, to interrupt you. Right, okay. So basically uh, it's just all this government. Next. So basically, this is just two different versions of a project that you can see. So the Najib one uh, is 65.5 billion, but the renegotiated one is drastically reduced to 30% to 44 billion. So not only that, uh, we have, uh, we increased the percentage of local participation uh, in ECRL up to 40% in the new uh new uh, proposal. Uh, not only that, the partnership to actually manage this one was also negotiated uh, between, uh, in the past, it was fully by Malaysian government, 
and Malaysian firms, but now it will be a joint management between CCCC and MRL. And next, I will pass to Zewei to uh, continue. All right, thank you, May. No, thank you, Zewei. Excuse me, excuse me, Zewei. I'm very sorry, but you just bring the conclusion of your yeah, work. No problem. I know I... it's a tentative one, but thank you very much. Sure, I think I'll do it within one minute. So in short, I'm just going to give an overview of the methodology that we did. So one of the main methodology will be interviewed with the elites, all right? And the elites, we promised to give them anonymous, so we couldn't divulge who are they. But what we can see that we are dividing it into three parts. First one, during Najib's government, where they initiate the project. Second one, after the general election, where the government changes the alignment and everything. And third one is the current government, um, who revert back to a lot of the originality of the project. So we divide into three parts and the people that we interview basically is from the, that we intend to interview is from the prime minister level, whether it's current or former, down to the minister level. So yes, we did manage to in touch with some of them. We, yeah, we cannot tell who is it exactly. So basically that'll be our methodology. So yeah, I think I'll stop here. Yeah, okay. I, I think we Julie. will stop here because I, we don't have too much time. And uh, uh, I think what we wanted to say is this is uh, still ongoing um, analysis, but we unpack the one of China and one of Malaysia. And for us, it's more interesting to see the renegotiation process from different actors. The actor not necessarily is a person, could be an institute. So I will stop here and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We thank you all of three of you very much and we will be in touch to to debate and maybe during the question and maybe after the seminar but it's very promising research thank you very much Antonin Morin now from uh, French scholar from Phnom Penh please your yeah. turn Antonin yeah I can share my screen thank you is it all right Is it all right? Yeah. Yes, please do. Okay, so uh, I will uh, briefly present a street development policy uh, initiated by uh, China in Southeast Asia. Uh, policy uh, policies that frame the establishment of the Chinese public company in Southeast Asia, especially in the renewable energy sector. First one is a Belt and Road Initiative. It's a bit uh, mainstream, but I will uh, cut it short. It, it's good for maybe for those who are not economists or just to kind of remember. Uh, borders of the Great Mekong subregion, uh, because uh, this policy, um, it's a lever for the next one, the I AIMS, ASEAN Interconnectivity of Mekong subregion. And uh, so that's why I will. Uh, explain maybe more precisely because it's not very well known. First one, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. On map one, uh, we have like the evolution of the different roads. The first one from 2001 in a red North Road and South Road, uh, it was made for oil and gas transportation. So in the pre-existing line of oil and gas, we have no new roads and railway. Uh, the second one, but it's not a uh, very uh, new one, it's officially quoted in 2006 in the Chinese uh, Kankinal Plan uh, in uh, bright uh, blue, it's the pair necklace, but well, it's not really new, but it's part of the Indochina Pacific diplomacy from the years 1960s and after it was been uh, uh, improved, etc. And it's targeting some uh, network cities for yeah, for the uh, uh, port, for uh, international uh, exchange, etc. But uh, this road uh, targets some uh, conflictual areas. So in 2011, the One Belt, One Road uh, is more diplomatic and is targeting uh, a capital city. So in 10 years, we had like a huge evolution between pre-existing roads new cities and after a more diplomatic way of uh, China internationalization. Uh, in 2013, all these roads were included in the new Belt and Road Initiative. There is two important uh, dates for the Belt and Road Initiative. 
it's the submit of the Belt and Road. The first one was in 2017, and the second one uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, I just propose this kind of maps, map two and map three. Uh, the source is from uh, Shanghai uh, Institute. Uh, the first one on the left, it's uh, on the uh, uh, official report, and it's quite funny because it begins like, uh, as France and England tried to do for, for centuries, we will uh, construct a, a railway uh, uh, from uh, Kunming to Singapore. So it, when we say China is not imperialism, why well, they, they, they play with words maybe, but still it's kind of a, uh, establishment. The new version of this map um, is on the right, with many corridors, Southeast Asian corridors. And it's back in uh, 2019, in the second summit of the Belt and Road Initiative that they changed their communication. And now we're talking not about roads, not about uh, capital or uh, network cities, but we're talking about corridors, the six corridors. Uh, why it's interesting to uh, remind about the Belt and Road Initiative. It's mostly about the communication around. The new strategy, it's made like uh, with uh, point lines, enlarging the Belt and Road Initiative. So now every uh, project in Southeast Asia are linked with the Belt and Road Initiative. I will cut short on the project, but well. Uh, next one, the Greater Mekong Sub Region. It's a policy start in 2002, the first one, 2002, 2012. Second one, 2012, for 10 years, 2022. Uh, there is a, a year that we can remind, it's the year 2014, because uh, it was some kind of conflict with the uh, commission of the Mekong River. And so the Chinese companies, and especially Sino Hydro, became the main actor of this policy in Southeast Asia. On the left, map number four, that the physical borders uh, of the Mekong, the blue line, it's uh, the, the connection with the Mekong, the river connection with the Mekong. And when we, when we say greater Mekong subregion, it includes five ecosystems, the Red River, the Salwin, the Irrawaddy, and the Sito. So when we talk about Mekong, it's Mekong, it's the blue lines, but the greater Mekong, it's the five region. It was quite a change because back in 2014, before uh, uh, following the commission, Thailand had much more important parts in the Mekong sub region. And here we are, uh, it's not a map made by me on the right, the map five. Uh, no, before we had physical borders to uh, frame the establishment of Chinese companies, especially in the hydraulic sector. But now we have this kind of maps from the Greater Mekong Subregion Policy with a rectangular strategy. Honestly, I don't understand anything about this map, but just what I remember, uh, what, I, what I get about this map is we don't talking about physical borders anymore. It's just conceptual borders. And these conceptual borders are very difficult to frame when we're talking about uh, a global occupation strategy of establishment and what is it inside or outside the Greater Mekong Subregion. And Mekong sub, uh, greater subregion, it might seem easy because we have a sectorial approach linked to energy. Uh, yes, we still can talk about uh, renewable or not uh, renewable energy, but it's energy. Uh, but this policy, it's also linked to another one we call AIMS, that's the Indian Interconnectivity of Mekong subregion, which are uh, providing infrastructure for energy transportation through uh, the Great Mekong uh, region. So what's that policy? Basically, they have an annual meeting. Uh, they call it the uh, Ministerial Forum of Renewable Energy in ASEAN. And uh, which kind of decisions they take in this forum? Uh, for example, in Vientiane, uh, they decide to uh, to, uh, uh, to raise the maximum level for hydraulic power before uh, every hydraulic installation above uh, 50 uh, megawatts was considered as non-reduable. And now in Vientiane, they decide that we can go to, to uh, 200 megawatts. Uh, another, uh, so they're they, they framing the law, the objectives, etc. 
But also they are signing contracts in 2015 in Kuala Lumpur. It's when uh, Sir Mao Chum from uh, uh, Shenzhen China Nuclear signs a one MDB contract. So it's to frame the law, but also to sign contract. And it's ASEAN plus one, plus China, of course, because it's a uh, Chinese policy. So what is the ASEAN interconnectivity of Mekong subregion? You can see on the map uh, the different uh, targeted territories. Uh, it's also uh, targeting some pre-existing lines, such as uh, ASEAN power grid and uh, Trans-ASEAN Pacific grid. Uh, which were some lines for oil and gas uh, transport. Uh, in 2021, 7.7 .7 gigawatts of electricity circulate through the lines of IMS, and they have an uh, objective of 30 gigawatts by 2024. Uh, why is it a comparison between Cambodia and Malaysia? Because the first IMS signed in 2014, must go to 2024. But in 2018, they signed another one with two new territories, new two priorities, Cambodia and Sarawak. Uh, it's a bit weird to think about the fact that uh, Sarawak, the development of Sarawak is a priority for the development of uh, the Mekong subregion. But well, we're still in this uh, enlargement of the uh, conceptual borders. Uh, I'm not geograph, but I'm not seeing if there is a river connection between uh, Sarawak and the Mekong, but still it's one of the priority. Uh, here, I will present a short focus about what happened in Cambodia following this policy. Uh, on the map six, the orange lines are the lines for the uh, electricity connection. So there is new lines targeting new cities. For example, here we have Sianoukville on the uh, right map. And before this line did not exist, but before in 2017, uh, Sianoukville uh, get a lot of Chinese investments from uh, casinos, from, uh, uh, yeah, especially from casinos. So because the city became so important, they could be part of the ASEAN interconnectivity of Mekong subregion. So the question is, it's the development of the interconnectivity is not really the first approach to developing a city. Sometimes when a city develops somehow for casinos or some other reason, uh, this line can uh, connect or any, uh, any cities can, uh, can, can try to be connected to these lines and they will participate to the enlargement of this kind of uh, policies of interconnectivity. Uh, here's the blue. Antonin, Antonin, yeah. merci beaucoup. You have to conclude. Okay, just to Thank quote you. the work of Christophe Gironde about con, uh, concession, territorial concession. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, back uh, since 2015, uh, it's not listed anymore. And the last point, uh, thank you for the piece. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's uh, Akun Santepip. It's the slogan from uh, Hansen. You have uh, Hansen here and uh, Ren Samri uh, on the middle. It's uh, two important uh, people in Cambodia. And yes, they are, they, they are benefiting from this Chinese investment. And Hansen is, in, is a prime minister of Cambodia for 40 years already. And, Yes, a last comparison between uh, Malaysia and Cambodia and Sarawak, especially comparing Cambodia and Sarawak. The, the main problem is not the fiscal evasion, but it's more like the huge amount of money entering the borders and uh, yeah, intended for public authorities. Uh, thank you for your intention. Uh, uh, well, I will not keep you waiting too long with this picture. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Antonin. Um, I was not so able to see the link between the renewable energy and the internal connectivity uh, pattern, but uh, I'm sure... Um... Yeah, it was about concession and how uh, industries such as aluminium uh, can, uh, uh, can establish uh, nearby uh, these policies. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, now I, I leave the floor to I leave the, the mic to Clément, which will organize a 
Q&A session and maybe quickly make some comments on the presentation. Clément, you have a, a few few time to do it, but I thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. So I will um, I will be as brief uh, as I can. So thank you, uh, Minhua and Elsa, to give me the chance to discuss uh, this uh, very rich presentation. Um, so as an economist uh, interested by the transformations of the industry within China and its projection abroad, uh, I see quite a lot of links to to be made here. So. Uh, um, I'll be very brief and I will skip all the, the introduction I had prepared and I, I go uh, directly to, to the question, which uh, basically can be summed up in, in one topic, which is um, uh, like for those working on BRI and in, in, on Chinese investments in, in Southeast Asia, uh, one of the main questions we have is to try to understand to what extent China is promoting new types of norms uh, in the region and uh, if China, thanks to its economic and political and, and symbolic power as well, has the capacity to, to become a new model in the region or uh, whether China um, uh, or what's at stake is more like a, a circulation of norms between China uh, uh, and ASEAN and, and a, a mutual uh, uh, influence between the, the two regions. So um, I, I'm really sorry, I will go directly uh, to the, the, the questions here. So I don't, yeah, so that's the background question. So for um, Hoi Ho Lin, uh, would you say that uh, Southeast Asian countries are uh, inspired by the firmly state controlled uh, Chinese financial model after uh, the 1997 crisis? They, they have endured and seeing uh, that the uh, uh, American model of capitalism was uh, really uh, threatened by the 2007 crisis. Um, or uh, on the opposite, do we have like Chinese financial actors which are also finding inspiration in uh, the financial system uh, um, uh, which are today uh, taking place in ASEAN countries and I think especially of Singapore here. To uh, Van Hunting Ha, um, would you say that uh, uh, Chinese investments in, in Vietnam are uh, only following an economic rationality or knowing the history and complicated relationships between the, the two countries that there is also something else behind the economic rationality? And also, um, would you say that uh, Chinese industrial development model is still seen as a model in Vietnam or is uh, uh, the Vietnam industrial grading following uh, and catching up, uh, following its uh, its own uh, strategy. Um, for uh, the the Malaysian uh, presentation, um, so that that was also very interesting, especially uh, if we put it in a more global uh, perspective. Um, would you say so? I had the chance to read the, the whole paper. So, um, uh, would you say that China is is investing in this? Uh, in, in countries which have a, a closer values, cl closer uh, norms in Southeast Asia, uh, because it has a, a lower leverage, a uh, lower power, if we compare, for example, to uh, America, to the US um, in, in Central America or France in, uh, in Africa in the, in the 20th century. And also, would you say that Malaysia is benefiting from uh, stronger leverage uh, in Southeast Asia if we compare it with uh, Laos and Cambodia, which allowed it to, uh, to really renegotiate um, its uh, contract. Uh, is it like an exception in Southeast Asia in that sense? To Antonin, um, uh, unfortunately, you didn't have the chance to, to go to the end of your presentation, but um, we know that uh, as like, from the very beginning, China has developed a win-win uh, uh, discourse on BRI. And at the beginning, the environment, uh, environmental issues were not really part of this discourse. And it progressively was uh, including like uh, greening the BRI, as we say. And would you say from your experience in, in Cambodia that uh, you see a change in recent years in the behavior of uh, uh, Chinese state enterprises? And, and would you say as well that the 
uh, rising investments in renewable energy follow only an economic uh, rationality or it's also a, a way to legitimize uh, Chinese investments uh, in, the, in the region. And finally, to conclude, to uh, Professor Boyer, um, would you say that it's in the interests of China to promote the economic and political integration of ASEAN, or should we expect the Chinese influence to uh, be impairing the uh, ASEAN integration? Thank you very much, and sorry for being so brief with such rich presentations. Thank you, Clément. So maybe we have still um, five minutes time for everyone to, to answer Clément's question, maybe then five minutes for answering some questions from the floor, and then the tea break will be <laughs> a, sip, a sip of tea break. Thank you. So who wants to start? Maybe Clément, you can leave the question on, on, uh, on the screen. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, maybe I can start because I was the last to, to talk um, uh, about... Uh, uh, can you put back your question, Clément, please? Yeah. Yeah. So is greening the BRI only a discord? Uh, yes, of course it is. Uh, but still in the projects, uh, half of the projects of the, included in the Belt and Road Initiative they have a green bond. It means they are applying uh, the international standards, uh, the uh, environmental and uh, social uh, and governance uh, issues recommended by the ONTAG, but also uh, some uh, other uh, standards. But they are only standards. After when they are uh, doing this project board, they are supposed to respect these standards, but once again, it's just stands out. So if they don't respect it, there is no institution who can blame them. They, they have uh, nothing, uh, they, they, they cannot be a fees or punish or anything. Uh, investment in renewable energy following only economic rationality. Well, sometimes most of the projects, they are not worth in the short time. That's why most of the time, the, following the build operate transfer, they have like an agreement for 44, 40 years, more than 40, normally it's 44 years, that the Chinese uh, uh, company, which built the infrastructure, a dam or solar panel, they purchase the electricity during that time, 40 years. And after 40 years, it's supposed to be worth it. But still, why is they doing this kind of project, losing money by buying an energy that they're not even using? Uh, they, they're not buying... Uh, the electricity of the Sarawak big uh, dams to transporting to big cities in China. They're buying it, but they don't use it. Uh, but, and it was the point that it was missing in my presentation. Sino Hydro, for example, has, many, has a very big network of industries, especially linked in the aluminum, in the pesticide, in the iron industries. And we see that when they construct a dam, Above this dam, there is uh, uh, many uh, industries and EV industries to, and this industry can make profits. So it's not irrational. Uh, I would like to say it's uh, irrational, but no, it's kind of following the capitalist logic. Thank you very much, Antonin. Uh, maybe Hui? From USM, would you answer? Uh, would you like to to to? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Elsa and Clemens, for your questions. But I think uh, your question is not directly related to our papers. But anyway, I just try to answer that uh, because, like just now, I have mentioned that during the period of twenty ten to twenty sixteen. Uh, China has been the, the eighth largest portfolio investor to ASEAN with the average of uh, 6.87 billion uh, of the portfolio investment. But, uh, and on the other hand, for the same period also, uh, ASEAN's portfolio investment to China is uh, very la much large, uh, about 77 billion. Okay, so uh, 
I think because this is due to uh, ASEAN in general, uh, the stock market or the equity markets is still relatively small compared to China. And uh, we can see that uh, a lot of uh, investors, especially the institutional investor, we still think that uh, they can uh, get a good profit from investing in China uh, due to the very significant growth uh, between the, the period of time that especially like recently for this the past or the 20 years that uh, they are growing or growing off the their stock market or equity market or financial market in general. And also on the other hand, uh, of course, uh, ASEAN market also is uh, an attractive to the China companies as well that uh, they try to, the, some of the Chinese companies will try to list it in the ASEAN stock market. For example, there are some, uh, as I know, that we listed in Singapore as well as uh, Malaysia. So, we, so therefore, we can see the financial integration uh, between China and also the ASEAN market. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ha, would you like to come back to the discussion? Oh, yeah, I would like to uh, answer the question. Please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, you're welcome. Okay, okay. yeah. If we look at the, the China investment in Vietnam, we should look at the more big, the bigger picture. Uh, in terms of uh, Vietnam and China, trade relation is more vibrant than the the investments, uh, the China investment in Vietnam. Uh, the, um, China is the biggest trading partner of Vietnam, and as I in my my presentation, the first phase of China China investment in Vietnam and the the F, the FDI from China is not big uh, among the, the partner of, of Vietnam. But after the China, they change the direction and they uh, carry out the BRI, BI in, initiative. We can see the investment from China to Vietnam is increased. And in some reason, the first is because of Vietnam is open economy. We participate in uh, some very big FTA, for example, CPTPP. Uh, recently, we signed the EU uh, and Vietnam trade agreement. So the the investor from China is they are so uh, they smart and clever. They they want to take advantage of some kind of Vietnam trade agreement with the EU. So uh, they input and they invest more in Vietnam textile and garment. Uh, sector. And another reason that the uh, US and China trade war, because the uh, US is the biggest importing the product from the Vietnam. And through the invest in Vietnam, some kind of product from the China, they can export to the US. They can avoid the tax from the US. So it's, uh, it's my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Boyer, would you like to answer Clément now or maybe we keep it yes. for another discussion? Maybe just one mm -hmm. word? One word. Yes, I think uh, it is part of the uh, changing strategy of, uh, of uh, China to have endogenous innovation and domestic market needs led. And in this respect, uh, it is very important to organize a division of labor among Asia, just to minimize the interaction financially and by international trade with US and Europe. And in a sense, uh, you have a very subtle uh, strategy for China. If uh, China is a big, is a big, big elephant, so there is a huge asymmetry of power. Therefore, you have to balance reaping uh, economic uh, returns from integration from the perspective of Chinese first and 
legitimizing Chinese investment in domestic arena. And so it will be a kind of bargaining, moderating the strength of uh, Chinese state firm not to block uh, the uh, regional integration. And lack, uh, last uh, element, uh, everything is up to the strategy of United State with Trump and his complete withdrawal with multilateralism. It was a good opportunity for China to, de to export its own model and build an alliance in order to de redesign in the very long term a new system which will be uh, get rid of the domination of dollar. So it is a very complex uh, element and the story is still to be uh, written. Nobody knows if the, the, the Chinese is so powerful that it could destroy ASEAN. And I think everything will be about a subtle uh, compromise between economic hegemony and political legitimacy of China within ASEAN. Very complex mechanism. Thank you. Um, I would suggest that uh, Chun Yi, Mei, and the yes. way you have only f few minutes, may even less okay. than a minute to, to answer. And I see that you're in the chat. Okay. The discussion is already going on. So, so right. please. Just I'll, I'll do it. We will conclude in, in one yeah. minute. And it's the way already answered in the chat of the questions. So, just to answer the uh, discussion's good question. I don't think we are looking at the values and norm in Southeast Asia. In a sense, we are looking at the interests. So I think the perspective or theoretical perspective we're coming from is from actually material interest rather than constructivism perspective of norm and value. Because the way I actually also notice uh, in our interview that it's not about the ethnicity of Malaysia Chinese in, in Malaysia that would enable the negotiation. It is in, from Malaysia's perspective, if there is an investment good for the interest, match to the interest, then it would be able to, to negotiate or renegotiate in that sense. So we are pretty much looking at what kind of interest different actors will be able to bring into. And uh, for the, the second question, the stronger leverage, from what we can see so far, Malaysia ECRL case is the only case that had a, a leverage. So, but it, we, we are not saying that's because Malaysia is very strong. We were just saying that it's because of there are several certain uh, specific circumstances from first domestic mm -hmm. politics, like the government has changed and right. it initiates the, the, the possibility to renegotiate. And the second point is that matched to both China and Malaysia's needs, less important. And in that sense, that needs, what we wanted to bring out to the table for discussion is, it is not China as a overwhelming one direction, because in Malaysia case, we see the interaction from the recipient country. It's possible to re renegotiate with China. So from the way I may, if you would like to please also add a bit of more empirical uh, observation, but short. I, I think I agree with you, especially on the second questions. I mean, short, we just hit to the correct time and correct person because of our domestic politics. And China have only two ways. One is to stop the project, get the compensation, as I mentioned. Or second one is to renegotiate. So I'll say it's due to domestic politics, which give us the leverage, not because of Malaysia is a bigger or stronger country. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we we have five minutes break. Please um, enjoy it, and we come back in really a few moments of time for the diversified influence of China in the region. Now, um, thank you very much. Uh, I see you in five minutes. Okay, thank you. So, dear. Uh, guests, dear students, dear colleagues, thank you very much for joining back the workshop. Uh, now Adele Esposito from uh, Bangkok now, <laughs> you're in Bangkok now, uh, will present uh, uh, her analysis, preliminary ones on urban production in Southeast Asia together with the BRI. If you are ready, yes, 
uh, Adele, please, yes. I, I suggest that we start. Thank you very much. Okay. So in this paper, I'll, I'll present some comparative perspective, which are based on analysis conducted uh, in the framework of a collective research program, in which we looked at the role of the BRI in uh, reshaping Southeast Asian secondary cities. So uh, last week, oh, it doesn't work, The sorry. We tested it before and the, okay, yeah. Can you say it like this? C'est bon? Yeah, okay. So um, last week, uh, Eric Frecon uh, mentioned a paper that he co-wrote with Delphine Alès in which they used Jervis' notion of misperception to analyze the gaps between, on the one hand, the understandings of the BRI as an overarching and consistent strategy uh, that would contribute to affirm China's imperialist ambitions, and on the other hand, the strategic reception of the BRI by partner countries who can exert their power of self-determination in selectively accepting or rejecting BRI-related projects and establishing relations of cooperation with the countries other than China. If we look at the urban field, we can say that it exists a consistent Chinese urban vision for cities that are located along BRI-related infrastructure. This vision is produced by an epistemic community of Chinese scholars who write numerous papers and books which fit within what Bao Gang He has defined as the delineated parameters of acceptable BRI academic inquiry. This para-academic production is less aimed at producing scientific knowledge about the BRI than at orienting investments and shaping a collective discourse about the future of the so-called Silk Road cities. This discourse considers cities as keynotes for enhancing and increasing the circulation of goods, people, capitals, and ideas. Henceforth, the network, the nexus, sorry, between urbanism and infrastructure is said to be structural uh, into the trajectories of the urban evolution for these cities. Indexes of global competitiveness are used to imagine a restructuring of the world cities urban network, this time centered on Asian cities. According to a twofold discourse, major economic capitals in Asia would see their primacy strengthened, all while secondary cities would be defined as new urban nodes. How is and up to what extent this overarching and worldwide vision transposed into urban projects? Is this vis vision misperceived by urban actors or used by them as a tool for self-determination? In the following, I sketch an hypothesis according to which the often controversial and tortuous implementation of the urban projects which are related to the BRI is always underpinned by an exact interpretation of this urban vision, which is used as a legitimating discourse. This is especially true in secondary cities for which gigantic infrastructure and real estate projects would be otherwise considered as oversized and unjustified. However, beyond this discourse, contextualized arrangements negotiate the weight of the Chinese part's involvement in local urban politics, as well as their visibility. These arrangements involve three main variables, namely uh, the degrees and modalities through which Chinese actors access land rights, the financial structures in which Chinese capitals are involved locally, and the role that these actors play in the definition of architectural and urban programs and in the decision-making process. The comparative analysis of the local definitions and combinations of these variables, as well as their evolution through time, may provide some keys for understanding the degree of opening of the local urban arenas to Chinese actors, and the other way around, the measures that Southeast Asian actors can establish in order to mitigate their influence. In other words, the analysis of urban projects can be insightful for appreciating the local variegated responses to the rise of China in the region and possibly identify a typology of responses by Southeast Asian counterparts. It is my ambition to sketch such, such a typology, which at the current stage of the research can only be based on fragmentary data. 
For this reason, I base my analysis on brief descriptions of urban projects located in Laos, Burma, and Malaysia that will help me inductively to elaborate on these three variables. In doing so, I uh, locate different national responses along a scale of graduation that goes from unbridled openness to cautious incorporation of Chinese contributions into localized programs. Laos appears to be uh, located on the extreme degree of openness on such a graduated scale. Along the Lao China Railway that connects Vientian to China through Boten, several special economic zones have been established in order to attract international investments. Some of these SEZ aspire to create new urban areas that are often called new cities. Various urban patterns are developed. A new center in the core of the national capital at Tat Luang Marsh in Mientian, a border city on both sides of the frontier at Boten Mohan, as well as new urban areas next to historic cities in Bang Bieng and Luang Prabang. As the investment law in Laos allows 100% foreign-owned investments, the Chinese companies are entitled to directly invest in these mega urban projects and secure their rights through 99 years land concessions. In these areas where regulations are more permissive, the developers shape the architectural and urban programs in an autonomous way. The spatial character of the zone contrasts with the routine ingredients that compose the new urban areas that typically include hotels, malls, schools, hospitals, and condominiums. A constellation of self-contained new urban development areas built and managed directly by Chinese owners are planned to punctuate the path of the railway. This newly crafted urban system recalls the Chinese axis of territorial graduated sovereignty theorized by Ai Ong, anchored at the Laotian national scale by the railway that runs through the country. However, in this case, urbanization does not seem to construct new no nodes for the canalization of different forms of flows. Rather, it seems to have the twofold function of fixating speculative capitals to real estate, all while creating new venues for Chinese tourism, thus further invigorating and expanding real estate investments by Chinese individuals. This process of foreignization, to quote a concept by our colleague Gabriel Fauveau, that we can appreciate in its extreme manifestation in the urban SEZ, can also be observed on a minor mode in the historical city of Vientiane, in which large parts of central urban land are granted to foreigners, and in particular to Chinese developers, as shown by the research conducted by our colleague, Keson Kanalikam. Such resemblance allows to ask whether the modalities of the urban production under the sign of the BRI allows for the extension into the realm of the ordinary city of the extraordinary norms and procedures for the spatial shaping of the SEZ. Seen through the urban lens, the case of Burma, and more particularly the new Yangon development that will, located, uh, be, will be located in the west of Yangon and should house 1.2 million people by 2050, helps identifying some strategic measures that local actors establish in order to mitigate the perception of the involvement of Chinese actors in local urban politics. The evolutive consortia of actors who are supposedly in charge of the project are symptomatic of local political oppositions to the Chinese foreignization. That brings first to the organization of an official call for tender in 2015, and later to the creation of a public company that is 100% owned by the Yangon regional government, and which is officially in charge of the development of the area. However, the company uh, devolved to the state-owned China Communications Construction Company the task of designing the master plan for the urban area and financing 100% of the project. The only contribution of the Burmese part would be the provision of land. A new wave of contestation brings to the launching of a Swiss challenge, supervised by the international consultant Roland Berger, a guarantee of impartiality for the attribution of the project a procedure that, in the way it is shaped, facilitates largely the Chinese company, all while opening up to a moderate level of competition. These procedures rely on national law to argue the project's accountability and legitimacy. 
I see them and their succession through time as screens that reduce the perception of the Chinese radiation in Yangon urban politics, but not it at its actual power as conferred by the domineering role played by the Chinese company. Furthermore, in the case of Yangon, the urban infrastructure nexus, which is structural in the development of the SEZ in Laos, is in the short term discursive rather than operational. On the one hand, the China-Myanmar economic corridor, of which the new Yangon city development should be one of the four pillars, is not planned to run through the new urban addition, which will be at least for a few years only accessible through bridges on the river. On the other hand, it is only on the long term, uh, 2050, that the new city is supposed to extend to the Martaban Gulf, where a new port should be developed. Henceforth, the projected infrastructure is used as an imaginative tool that allows the new Yangon city to fit within the overall urban vision for the new Silk Road cities endorsed by local actors. The case of the Melaka Gateway in Malaysia represents yet another degree of mitigation of the Chinese interference onto the urban arena. The mega project for a new urban district on reclaimed land that comprises a deep sea uh, port uh, was launched in 2010 and later integrated into the maritime Silk Road. Cash Development, a local company specialized in manufacturing and construction, was in charge of the project. The company leads a joint venture that initially involved foreign investors of various origins, but the later was narrowed down to a cooperation with Chinese companies that however dropped from the project to let the floor to yet other groups of Chinese companies. The volatility of the composition of the Chinese counterpart is concealed by Cash role as the project main designer and manager. In other words, Cash a local urban actor makes a strong claim of self-determination in the urban arena, which is facilitated by the availability of Chinese capitals, as well as by the perspective of for the new port to be integrated into the maritime Silk Road. However, political endorsement to the project at the federal level was directly related to previous Prime Minister Najib Razak, whose relation to Chinese diplomatic milieu, as we have seen uh, from the other presentation, and clientelist acceptation of Chinese projects were involved in the accusation of corruption and misuse of funds. After he was convicted, the national governments that came into power opposed this project too. In 2020, the termination of the three years contract, which was granted to the company for the reclamation works and delays in the works caused by uh, the COVID pandemics were used as pretext to refuse the renewal of this contract, despite the company's appeal to court, through which the company has even tried to reinforce its self-determination by fighting directly against the Melaka state on legal basis. This case study shows that the Chinese involvement in the project, in the project and criticisms about it has been incorporated into the national political and legal debate. Chinese involvement is one argument amongst others in the debate that include environmental impacts and utility of the project itself. To conclude, the impressionistic overview of the projects that I sketched here illustrates three degrees on the graduated scale of the reception of the Chinese influence from wide opening and high level of interference in the case of Laos to the incorporation of Chinese contributions capitals and expertise into the local Malaysian urban politics. The case of the Eastern Economic Corridor in Thailand that I haven't had time to develop here would probably show yet another and more intense degree of self-determination because it plans to integrate foreign capitals, among sweet Chinese, into a national development corridor centered on the urban infrastructure nexus that will connect Thailand to the Greater Mekong subregion and the BRI. This overview, I hope, opens up an avenue of investigation on the relevance of the urban lens to measure and appreciate the diversity of responses to the BRI and their entanglements with economic liberalism and nationalisms in Southeast Asia. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Adele. Uh, Jimmy, if you are ready, maybe you could start. 
every question to Adele can be asked on the chat and also uh, at the end during the Q&A moment. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, thank you, Elsa, for having, uh, having, having time me. Uh, I'm a uh, um, senior race, a PhD student in sociology, so it's quite different that we have heard today. So in my research, um, I'm interested in the state strategies related to the internationalization of higher education. So, so today I present to you the building of strategic links between China and ASEAN through student mobility and international branch campuses. Okay. So before I start talking more about internationalization strategies, we need to clari clarify what internationalization is. This phenomenon should be distinguished from the globalization of higher education. So we have not, uh, I've not the true definition. So these two phenomena should not be confused. They are interconnected, but they are they are not the same phenomenon. Most of the time, internationalization is a phenomenon that has a positive connotation, while globalization is just as negative. It's not surprising that internationalization is used to describe processes that are linked to the global globalization of higher education, such as the commodification also, Internationalization is a global process that integrates all dimensions of education. So, this phenomenon was still until the 19th, described only by a few universities to stand out in the competitive space. Today, it's become sensual and generalized and those at all levels, local, institutional, national, regional, international. So that is interesting in the internationalization strategies like student mobility, academic mobility, international uh, program, or uh, international branch campus, etc., etc. They were reactive to follow the development of higher education. Now, these strategies are proactive to predict the future of higher education. So internationalization in both seen as a means to respond to globalization, but also a goal for higher education. Of course, internationalization is not a natural phenomenon, is loaded with ideology fueled by the actors themselves, institutional institution public policies, but it is perceived as a good practice that allow improving the quality of education and research. So, so the internationalization strategies are not the internationalization process. The strategies fit this process and they are specific according to the institution, the degree levels, the type of university, and it's depend on the country as well. The student mobility and the international branch campus are the most visible elements of the internationalization of higher education. So my presentation today is focused on this point. So now the internationalization, especially in Southeast Asia, it's important to say this region has known in a very short time the obligation to create, develop its higher education and internationalize it at the same time. Higher education in Southeast Asia can be analyzed as future. So Singapore, so you can see the, the figures. So Singapore is at the stage of universalizing its accessibility to higher education system, while Malaysia or Thailand is at the stage of massification near to universalizing, and Cambodia or Myanmar has remained at the stage 
of being with the foreign elites. So more generally, all the country of Southeast Asia are facing an exponential increase in the number of national students, coupled with a drop in government investment and the obligation of internationalization are both about an important private education sector to support both local and international demand. So there is an, an, an acceleration of the privatization of higher education in this region. So we need to understand the national context to understand the internationalization that exists in this country. This context flows into the process always, or as well as the global context. So in this race for international development of universities, international students are the most visible part as well as the infrastructural elements like the e IBCs, so International Branch Campus. So the attraction of international students in ASEAN is very unbalanced. Indeed, given the structural difference in higher education, countries such as Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand are seeking to develop their position as a knowledge economy and as a regional and international education hubs. At the same time, countries as Laos and Myanmar welcome international students too, but it remains very marginal. China, through its students, is a major player in these strategies. It is the world's the world largest source of international students with almost 1 million students abroad in 2018. In ASEAN, there are three profiles of Chinese students according to the scientific literature and what is observed in institutional discourses. Initially, a large majority were students who have failed the Gaoko, the entrance exam for higher education in, in China, and the student went to study abroad. For example, this student can be found in certain private university in Malaysia or public university in Thailand. And then we've also, for the undergraduate level, we have also students who have passed the Gaoko and will go to the prestigious foreign university for training. For example, Singapore, in uh, like NUS or NTU and uh, even in Malaysia too, so UN, University Malaya. So, and finally, there are a postgraduate student who seek to train at the very high level, particularly for research. So, but in terms of data, it is impossible to know what the respective ratio of these three profiles. However, we can see the general evolution of attraction for ASEAN from 2006 to 2017 through UNESCO data combined with data from national reports. So we can see the figures. So there are three trends emerge. So the first trend focuses on countries with a low level of internationalization to, due to their less developed higher education system, but which attract a few Chinese students, but whose ratio is very high compared to the other international students, Chinese are the majority. So we can see the, the Laos or Myanmar. So, but the number is very, very less. The second trend focuses on countries such as Malaysia, which have a very high number of Chinese students, but whose ratio has been decreasing for the 10 years. And the third trend focuses on countries such as Singapore and Thailand, which have a very high number of Chinese students, 
and are the leading nationality in terms of ratio. So this trend has to be understood according to the, level, to the level of internationalization and development of higher education and also the relationship between the host country and China. During my interview that I made from, uh, with top management in some university for my thesis, not related to this topic, but the question of dependence on the link with China comes up several times. Indeed, for example, in Thailand, Chinese student mobility was perceived as necessary, but at the same time, it was problematic because they are overrepresented in the Thai university. So there was both a sense of hyperdependence and the fate of this mobility. Some universities and the food them government will try to attract some other nationalities to diversify their internationalization. So rapidly in the, in the global scale, ASEAN is one of the places where proportionally Chinese students are very present, but only concentrate, concentrated a small ratio in terms of number. So we can see just 6% in 2006 and 4% in, uh, 2000, uh, in uh, 2070s. So, however, however, there was an overrepresentation in 2006 when one in three students was a Chinese student in ASEAN. Whereas today is followed the global trend, so the global trend for Chinese students is 17%. So, so we can see the, the increase of number of Chinese students so the, around in the world, but the ratio, particularly in the Western countries, so, such as the United States or Canada or Australia is very, very high. Jimmy, only two minutes left. Yeah. Thank you. So Chinese students have has been coupled with other internationalization strategies developed by both China, China and ASEAN governments. So we can see effectively the international branch campus too. The IBC are also strategic co-building and of course they are combined with state specific strategies. So for my conclusion, according to Dr. Peter Cheng, he's pointed out the IBC or alliances are two-way bridges between China and the country's concern. In addition, not that to speak only of soft, to speak only uh, of soft power when talking about these strategies, in higher education regarding China is, reduct, uh, is, is reducted both for the country's concern and for China as well. So Chinese mobilities, IBC as well partnerships that China is making with ASEAN University are always in the line with their national strategies and vision. China responds to the need of strengthen educational hubs such as in Malaysia and the development of highly qualified human resources, such as in Laos. Finally, China supports internationalization strategies and it's one of the major players. For example, if you look the MOUs signed between the University of Malaya and Chinese university compared to other universities, China is the first by far. At the same time, ASEAN also support China's strategies because if you look at the outgoing student mobility from ASEAN, we can, and we can take the Chinese Ministry of Higher Education figures in 2018, uh, yeah, 2018, international students from Southeast Asia were almost 
80,000 at least. One in five students come from ASEAN. So there is a desire on the part of China to attract the students. In addition, ASEAN appears to be a support for the internationalization of China higher education, which is fundamentally needs to build itself at, as an international education hub, the most important in Asia, and to be competitive with higher education in the Western world. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jimmy. So uh, it has been very convincing, your presentation. We will continue in mobilizing different theoretical frameworks, methodologies, and in order to, to bring a very accurate, updated, and detailed piece of information of uh, the Chinese presence in the region. So to continue on, we will listen to Xiong Nian from Hanoi. Thank you very much. And after Zong, we will have uh, Laure Siegel from Bangkok on the journalist situation. Thank you, Diang. Uh, thank you, Ensna. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Diang from uh, Star, Vietnam U Union of Science and Technology Association. And uh, may I uh, introduce uh, Ms., uh, Professor Phan Bích San, uh, next to me is former uh, Secretary General of WUSTA. He is a specialist in sociology. And we are very happy uh, today to attending this seminar uh, and have some sharing with you about the uh, law draft of Association of Vietnam. Uh, I also make some comparison with uh, the norms on Association of France and China uh, that symbolize uh, Western and Eastern um, models. So the law on association is one of the important laws that the uh, that the party and government of Vietnam are planned to draft, uh, especially after that the constitution of Vietnam has been revised in 2013. Uh, the elaboration of this law started in the year of 1990, uh, but officially submitted to the National Assembly in uh, 2005 and 2014. However, uh, freedom of association is a large and a complex issue. So this law raises many different opinion, opinions. So up to now, this uh, draft law, this, this law has not uh, approved yet. So to uh, compare, um, to compare the, the, the uh, we are first. We are go uh, go back to uh, the legal framework of two of two country. Uh, France has the law. Uh, Song is uh, the law of uh, 1901, and China and Vietnam has currently uh, no law, uh, and there are only uh, the legal document under the law, as you can see in the slide. Um, uh, China has a uh, three regulation. In 1990 and 2004, and Vietnam has uh, uh, regulated association uh, field in the uh, by the decree, decree uh, number 35 in 2010 and the decree number 80 in 2020. And both Vietnam and China is in the pro uh, is the process of reviewing and amending uh, uh, all the regulation. And although the system of the legal framework is different, all three countries consider association rights as a fundamental principle uh, having constitutional value. About the concept, uh, the definition uh, association in three countries, uh, there is an influence of the French law on the law of Vietnam. Uh, by the definition is association in, in the order uh, 52 in, in 1946 and order 102 in 1957 approved by President Ho Chi Minh. Uh, 
uh, but for now, uh, currently, uh, in, uh, Vietnam applied the decree 45 uh, in 2010. Uh, in 2010, and um, by a definition uh, uh, longer. And uh, mostly, uh, this uh, the management of association is uh, regulated by this decree. And China defines uh, the social organization by three types of organization, including uh, social, uh, social food foundation and social service organization. Both China and Vietnam exclude certain associations from the scope of application uh, in the regulation. Um, for Vietnam, uh, in, the, in the decree 45, uh, uh, this decree not uh, applied to six mass organizations that's mostly created and uh, directed by party and uh, uh, or most of the uh, organizations were created in the war period. Uh, for example, uh, the Vietnam for the Land, the General Syndicate uh, of Vietnam, the Vietnam Farmer Association, Communist Yacht, Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam Women's Union, Vietnam Veterans Association. About the issue of uh, uh, legal status. So, uh, France recognizes the existence of all associations with or without declaration, while Vietnam does not recognize the group uh, without registration. And for the procedure, uh, so to create an association uh, in France, they uh, apply the declaration mechanism with a very simple administrative procedure. It takes uh, normally five days and it registration is in prefecture. Uh, Vietnam, uh, Vietnam and China apply the license mechanism with a uh, uh, very, very strict and uh, long, complicated administrative procedure. It usually takes uh, from uh, three to six months to get a response from the authorities at all level. Uh, at uh, national level is the minister of home affairs and at, at uh, local level is the chairman of people com committee. As uh, yeah, the condition to create uh, uh, an association in Vietnam, so according uh, the, the article, it, uh, the, uh, an association have uh, its name, uh, principal purpose, scope of field, head office, tribe chapter, uh, approved by authority, powder uh, and uh, independent property. So uh, there is uh, some case of refusal of the license issuance. An association will be will not be a issue license if they uh, if the name or the scope of activity. Uh, is identical or confusingly similar to the name of another uh, association is uh, already established. And the, uh, the case of uh, who, who is the limited uh, of the right of association, you can see here so five, uh, five laws is uh, one, the number one and two is very general. So you can see is the four three, the number three four five. So uh, the officer of state agency or person working in the military can only uh, create the visit uh, joy or direct uh, or leave uh, association when they, they they are appointed by state agency or uh, only after five years of uh, their retirement. Uh, the about the issue uh, related to foreigners. So uh, it is uh, uh, very sensitive uh, uh, issue of uh, even for the Western model. Um, in Vietnam and China, this matter is the more limited and restricted. In China, the association uh, regulation only apply to 
uh, by Chinese uh, citizen and the regulation apply to citizen of Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, foreigner, if they are responsible for fund in China and reside within Chinese territory for a regular period, at least three months per year uh, for Vietnam in Optical, uh, 17 of Decree 45, joint, ven uh, joint venture enterprise and foreign owned enterprise uh, operate in Vietnam, uh, make contribution to an association development and agree with the association charter may be considered and recognized by an economic association to be their associate member. And associate member have the very limited rights uh, for example, they cannot uh, vote as a leader of association. About the foreign aid, um, the fundraising uh, and the implementation, uh, uh, implementation of project and program uh, is a uh, 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 very administrative, uh, very strict administrative regulation. In the uh, decision of uh, 76, uh, uh, stipulate that the international conference and seminar are related to political security, defense, ethnic, religious issue, or human rights uh, must be approved by the prime minister when holding a conference. And in the draft law, uh, the latest uh, draft law in uh, 24 October 2013. Stipulates that association are not affiliated joint foreign association or do not receive a foreign sponsorship. So it's very limited. And it's more and more difficult to, for association to receive uh, foreign aid. So what, uh, what is the policy to, to particular uh, association? All three countries uh, have a special policy for particular association. France has the mechanism public utility to what association that serve the objective of state. And in China uh, also they have the NGO or association uh, uh, created by government. So, and like Vietnam now, uh, Vietnam uh, regulates this issue by the decision 68 in 2010. And uh, this ident identified 28 particular associations. Most of them are pol political associations, social, political, or professional associations. And these associations can receive partially or totally the finance or the subvention from the government. Uh, to perform the mission aside by state and party. Uh, for example, uh, USTA, Vietnam Union of Science and Technology, Vietnam Union of Frenzy, or Vietnam Journalist Association. Uh, about the issue of intervention uh, in internal affairs association, why France uh, minimize the uh, interference uh, to the internal affair of association, uh, Vietnam and China in construct. Uh, the Congress, uh, the leader of the association must be approved by the authority and uh, uh, the draft law has uh, a chapter five to uh, regulate all the uh, rule regulation on the most uh, most uh, consolidation, division, separation of association, and all this the process uh, must be approved by authority and report to the authority. So, with the how how is the mechanism for the for the protection of the right to freedom of association? France has a strong mechanism for the protection of the right uh, of the right uh, by civil court, administrative courts, and constitutional council. Vietnam has not uh, a constitutional council or a national agency responsible for conduct training or research or proposing the measure to promote uh, human rights. 
and uh, all the uh, all the mechanism is uh, all, uh, uh, is based on the law on complaint denunciation and other relevant law, but the mechanism mechanism is very quick. So it can be said that with a geographical, geopolitical position as well as colonial history, uh, Vietnam is uh, influenced by many cultures, both from the East and the West. Uh, basically, uh, we, can deny that, we can deny that China has uh, influenced uh, in the social and economic development of Vietnam. Uh, it's re reflected uh, in the concept in many norms and and the direction, the method of management of on association in Vietnam currently, uh, we can see that uh, the method of management uh, of Vietnam and China is quite similar uh, in many points. But uh, in the context, in the context of, uh, of increased uh, and deep international and regional integration, especially after. Uh, the addition of Vietnam to many agreements such as uh, CCTPP or EVFTA, there will be an important change in the future in the concept and in the method of management in this field of Vietnam to respond uh, the requirement in the accordance to the international regulation and treaties. Thank you for, for the listening. Thank you very much, Jiang, for this very compelling case study on the law of association in, in Vietnam, uh, where the question of the norm is very obvious, uh, which is not so much the case uh, for the journalist and freedom of press experience, where uh, a, a subject uh, about which Laure Siegel will talk now. Thank you, Laure. It's your turn. And mute is OK? Yes, it's OK. Okay, so hello to everyone. Thank you for still being there. And uh, I'm gonna um, give you a quick um, overview first without image about the, the risk and updated assessment for the risk for media in Southeast Asia uh, in the context of a growing political authoritarianism. So we know that since 2018, the whole of Southeast Asia has been ranked in the bottom third of the press freedom index uh, by reporter without borders. So among the threats, we have um, an intense intensification of uh, online street harassment, lawsuit conviction, imprisonment, murder, but also we have mass job losses and dire working condition. So all of this has become worse since the pandemic and the establishment of emergency states in most countries that has happened with it. So the, the, the consul consolidation of conservative movements and autocratic regime, most recently, as we've seen in Myanmar, uh, has precipitated the collapse of traditional media. Uh, and on top of this, we had a drop in advertisement revenues uh, because of the internet and social network pose very acute democratic challenges to the, to the debate and the production of information. But what was interesting is that there was um, a big survey uh, two years ago by the International Federation of Journalists among thousands of media workers in Southeast Asia. And the, and the biggest threat among all this uh, difficult situation actually was the precarity. This is the biggest professional threat they in identified. Um, so wages are very low in the industry at the region and there is no resource to pursue proper investigation, even renew material. Um, and as I said, most of the traditional media have not anticipated um, the digital transition. So they are simply not able to function, newspaper or TV channel mostly. Um, and in, in, in Thailand in one year, 800 journalists have been fired just in one year, just in TV, in broadcasting. So um, they can no longer afford to pay the production costs, the operating license and the salaries of the employees in the region. 
so just to give you um, a, a broad uh, some some examples. So we have uh, Gavroche that you might know, the magazine for French-speaking journalists in Thailand. So this has stopped the publishing print version. The Nation, which was on the one of the two English language dailies in Thailand has stopped also. And the Bangkok Post has cut the whole um, Sunday supplement for investigative reporting. Uh, two months ago, we have Kaosot that has closed the English newsroom. So now we're in a situation where we have mostly a tabloid press, which is still there because it's full of advertisement, or we have still independent reporters who, um, who broadcast live Facebook. So the live Facebook are really the thing that are still there in every event, uh, but there is no choice of it is there and then it's, it's not. So um, this is where China enters in the picture because uh, the West and particularly the, the United States and the, the previous administration, as we know, has win withdrew some interest from Southeast Asia. So now we have um, a local media which has no funds and uh, China has used some of this situation uh, as the emerging power. So we know that thousands of foreign journalists in all the countries are regularly invited to seminars in, uh, in China to learn how to, I quote, tell the China story well. So we also know that Beijing is expanding the offer of student scholarship in the journalism school, and there is editorial cooperation more and more for the region. Um, so that was interesting. Um, for example, during it had a particular important impact in how the demonstration in Hong Kong were covered in the regional media. Um, because the violence was mostly attributed to the protesters in the Chinese state media. And um, what was interesting is that since 2019, uh, we have many collaboration between regional media and uh, Xinhua, so the Chinese state on news agency. So Xinhua will offer a free subscription to, um, to all his information to newspaper here. So we have the Mania Bulletin, the Khmer Times in Cambodia, also the English in Thailand when it was still there. Um, and they justify it by saying, uh, we, we want to use this free exchange of content with the aim of diversifying sorry, our media coverage of China. So this is a very attractive proposal because a lot of online outlets, as I said, can um, have no money, cannot afford a subscription to ISP, to AP or Reuters, which are relatively pricey for media company. So as we know who puts the money in, we'll get the ver its version of the story out. So it was really important in, um, in during, during Hong Kong. So I'm just gonna share uh, my screen for, um, for one minute to show you um, um, the Mania Times from 2019. Okay, uh, so this is straight out of Xinhua News Agency, and it has been printed in, um, in, in many outlets uh, among the region with no rewriting or anything. So uh, we saw the same um, phenomenon very recently in uh, Myanmar, uh, where um, you might know that um, some Chinese factories have been burned uh, in the Western industrial part of Yangon. Um, we have no evidence of who did it yet because no one is able to make a proper investigation there. But as for Hong Kong, most of the violence in uh, all the violence in Chinese media has been attributed to the to the protesters. So this is the narrative that is uh, printed again and again. Um, that, that is pushed for the domestic, but also the international audience by the expansion of um, in editorial collaboration. But I really want to stress that this is only one aspect and one very recent aspect of the of the war of the war of information which is going on in the region, and which is mostly affected by by national dynamics. So and this are posing challenge to local journalists for for decades be, before China was so powerful before. So across the region, uh, each country, we have to know what is. Um, what is off limits for us um, 
So it's geographical, it's also topical. So in terms of geography, we have a, a pernicious self-censorship, but also uh, it's well established in areas which are under de facto military control. So it's off limit to the media. It's, uh, so we have, for example, the, the island of Mindanao, the border region of Burma, or West, Western New Guinea in Indonesia, the deep south of Thailand. So it's conflicts between autonomous religious or ethnic groups and central governments for decades. And this is not something we are able to, to cover properly. Um, simply for access reason. Uh, and then in terms of topics, uh, any critical commentary on the monarchies in Thailand, Cambodia, Brunei, or the one-party communist system in, in Vietnam, in Laos, the activities of the army and workers' unions, uh, especially in Burma, the special economic zones allocated to China in border and port region, the strict application of Islamic law and force with corporal punishment in, in Brunei, the Maldives and some Indonesian and Malaysian province. And finally, the, the draconian judicial system in, uh, in Singapore. All of this is, um, is severely punished if it's uh, properly um, investigated and published and the uh, real names. So in terms of geography and topics, this is wha what we are working in a frame. And we, we should not forget that Southeast Asia is, um, even if it doesn't have this um, uh, reputation, it was one of the most dangerous territory for media for a long time. So the, the, the biggest massacre of journalists happened in Southeast Asia 10 years ago huh, in the Philippines in 2009. So 58 people, uh, mostly journalists, were kidnapped and executed during a, a political campaign uh, tour. Um, and 10 years later, none, none of the 200 men were uh, in, in, implicated and no, no, no justice yet. And it's continuing. Huh? It's uh, almost 200 deaths of journalists in Philippines since the end of the dictatorship in the 86. And the Center for Media Freedom in Manila tell us that 90% of the journalists who have been um, attacked and killed uh, were investigating local corruption and criminal organizations. So this is the, the topic that, that gets you there. And I want to mention here uh, Maria Ressa that you might be familiar with, who is a, a famous journalist in the Philippines and she founded the, the Rappler. So they were one of the only outlet to go after um, after how Duterte was elected uh, with, the, um, with the establishment of an army of uh, cyber activists working for him uh, by uh, attacking a lot of other pro-democracy activists uh, online and on the street. So there was a lot of uh, death rape threats against this woman. And she calls this, uh, she calls the Philippines the, the patient zero of a global epidemic that she say is state-sponsored online hate. So this is really difficult because we have now the um, uh, unregulated online world, uh, which is manipulated by different parties. And when it's the, the state in an election uh, context, it's extremely difficult to combat. Um, so, we have um, we are working in a in an in a region where um, uh, we cannot really settle in any, uh, in some countries because, for example, uh, okay, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam, Brunei are considered a country where the independent media don't exist anymore, the non-state media. So in Cambodia, it happened in July, July 2018, just before the general election. And then um, the, the press was literally obliterated. So in months, 30 radio were taken off the air. Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, Cambodia Daily, Phnom Penh Post, all of it is, um, is over. So now we have half of the, of the country where there is simply no, no press and even if the country was a still is. So in Thailand, the, the political situation has had a, a very important impact on, uh, on media since the, the last coup. Uh, so for example, the community radio station, the opposition channel, 
uh, were repeatedly banned. So there was no really opposition TV since 2014 in, uh, in Thailand. Um, and on um, and and all of this is used by uh, is used and uh, implemented by violent direct means or simply by softer uh, legal ways. So um, we have all this arsenal of anti-publishing and anti-defamation law that's dating from the colonial era. The, the British and the French here have put this law uh, in place against the um, autonomist uh, movement at the time. And now it has been adapted by the regime en place for the internet age. So we know that Donald Trump did a lot to popularize a, a very simplified vision of, uh, of fake news, this particular information disorder. Um, and this expression was manipulated a lot by leaders here who started labeling an information which did fit the narrative as fake news. And then the next step is that to establish anti-fake news center um, during political events, religious demonstration, terrorist act, natural disaster. So this is done mostly by uh, reducing very um, sharply the speed of internet to cut the virality of things um, or to ban completely the um, access to online platform, mostly Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, usually. Um, so, um, so these platforms have no responsibility. You, you might also know that Facebook had a huge uh, uh, impact in how anti-Rohingya information has been disseminated in, uh, in Myanmar. Um, and not much has been done to, to cut these pages. For years, the pages on Facebook were able to, um, to publish this kind of very discriminative narrative. So now we, we know that uh, uh, Facebook has opened uh, a, a data center in, uh, in Singapore and um, where the government has a near monopoly on, on the media. So the, the committee to protect journalists is pretty worried that um, the authorities would like to make Facebook subject to very harsh media laws. Um, so we have to be very careful of who owns the information and with this platform, the owner is, is very far and doesn't take much responsibility. Um, so journalists in the region knows that the, the, the fight that's essential is to, uh, to fight their own laws in their own country. Um, so Stephen, Stephen Gen, for example, from Malaysia Kinin um, in Malaysia as, a, as an idea that uh, so I, I'm going to quote him. He said, we don't deny that there is a problem of misinformation in Malaysia, but it, it's not the government's job to decide of the veracity of information. The goal is for the industry to regulate itself effectively so that the government no longer has an excuse to pass this law. So this requires education in general, to the media in particular, a requirement for transparency by prohibiting direct funding of media by political parties, and the establishment of a truly free press council. So it was mostly the, um, the main conclusion that the Asia Center in Bangkok uh, published recently in his last report. Uh, so the main recommendation is to make sure the media have the resources to fulfill the mission and to set up independent council implementing an ethic chart uh, as the industry. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, just to finish with my general uh, presentation, the, the next fear, uh, everybody's fighting their the own law nationally. Um, Thailand is less majesty in Malaysia, it is in Indonesia in something else. But uh, on top of this, there is this, this, this fear now that um, much more heavier online surveillance system will be um, implemented in those countries on the model of, of China. Um, so to go back to, to Myanmar, which is the most striking but tragic example at the moment, the, today uh, soldiers are confiscating satellites uh, in Yangon uh, to get access to international channels. So we already know that the access to social media sites, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, is uh, mostly cut there. And uh, even the Tor, um, you might be familiar with the Tor software, which uh, enable private navigation. So um, 
this has been cut the, the data for huh? G mobile internet and then the Wi-Fi public. So we are going to a full end of telecommunication, uh, very brutal from one month to another. And what's interesting is that people reacted uh, pretty um, quickly to, to, to this end of telecommunication that is really coming in, in this week, it's, it's, it's over. Um, so now we have SIM cards from Thailand that are passed uh, in Myanmar because it's still working on some, um, in some areas. But we have also very basic pre-internet tools of communication. So we have um, uh, leaflets, CB radio, and even propaganda podcast like Operation Ainoi Ana that I want to show you. Uh, so Operation Ainoi Ana is... Um, are you all seeing? Maybe this one is more interesting. Yeah, the brief history. I just put you this. Uh, so no, it's a group in. Uh, sorry? Well, it's, it's, your time is over. So maybe uh, you can give the reference to this in the yeah, chat. Yeah, that was the last for the presentation. So I'm just going to send the link. Yeah. Um, so that was just a, an example of how people react to the total end of, uh, of telecommunication. And this is a um, um, psychological warfare. So they, they record audio, uh, songs, or just uh, talk. And this is blasted through villages or army base camp to try to, um, to turn the soldiers um, to the civil disobedient movement side, uh, and it's inspired by, why, by what was done by uh, Vietnamese activists during the, um, the Vietnam Wars um, to try to um, have the Americans defect their side. So um, as, a, as a conclusion, sorry, I wanted to draw two examples, but um, at the moment, we are also supporting a group of local reporters in Myanmar who are trying to send as much as they can um, every picture they, um, they have. So for every day they send, we caption, and uh, this is supposed to be a database that will be of historical importance because they send it every day since the first day of the coup and uh, we from eight different locations. So it's interesting on an academic uh, level in the sense of its professional journalists who have been um, trained as such and they offer a picture that are captioned, that are dated, that are verified, that are translated. Um, and this is the only way we can still have something going out of these countries. Uh, so my, my conclusion would be that um, I would say that a healthy cooperation between people affected by a certain event, it can be a coup, it can be a dam construction, it can be a, a natural disaster, but, and then media workers and then academics and if everybody shares tests, tasks, and information, we are able to make a concerted push to request accountability and transparency. Uh, because for the moment, the fact that authorities or private company uh, don't give out much data, um, and that the people don't have the tools to publish their own data, give us a very small focus on what's happening. And uh, the most important is to found people on the ground who can still get out information. So the, the story would be able to be um, written and remember as it happened. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Um, so now we are, we are late, totally late. Um, in Singapore is more than seven o'clock uh, in the evening. So I leave the, the mic to, uh, my colleague from East Asian Institute. Please, uh, Chuan Yuan, the um, last words will be used before Chen Gan conclusion. Okay. Merci. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, speaker's uh, information and wonderful uh, presentation. They explore the role of China in Southeast Asia country from different angles and methods as well as problem faced by each country. 
uh, due to the limited time, I will not ask many questions, but uh, summary the key contribution and provide some suggestion uh, for further study. And for the first uh, presentation, it discussed the urbanization and infrastructure in Southeast Asia under the Build and Rule Initiative from the perspective of international relation theory and explaining China's strategy and the response of local participants in Southeast Asia. Although the cooperation between China and Southeast Asia can take many forms, such as uh, policy communication and people-to-people -people exchange, infrastructure construction, or more generally, the process of urbanization is the top priority. The author also took out a few more typical uh, examples of China involvement, including the Special Economic Zone in Laos, the new Yangon City project in Yangon, and the construction of the lawyer port of Malacca in Malaysia. I think the author can make this discussion more complete or persuaded from the following two directions. First is regarding to the intellectual review. The presentation certain touch on the current topic is discussed and how the author choose his own research approach based on these arguments. Second, it could be greater if the author can add some more cases and then make some comparison or try to verify some existing urbanization theoretical models. The second presentation is about the internationalization of university in Southeast Asia by the impact of China. It discussed the development of China high education in Southeast Asia country in terms of the number of students and the institutions and argue that China keen to build up an international education hub to compete with higher education from Western uh, world. There are two parts that can be extended from the discussion. I think you found that there is a big gap between the number of students of China and the China Education Institute developed in Southeast Asia. If the, uh, the article can further explore the influencing factor behind this development gap, such as their national education policy, uh, the ultimate goal of China, which want to challenge the dominant rule of Western country in higher education in Southeast Asia will be inspiring. Uh, also, talking about the influence, Chinese Confucius Institute or Chinese Language Education Institute may be more influential than its higher education insti institution in Southeast Asia country. If the article includes them for discussion, will be a more comprehensive understanding of China uh, education internationalization. Uh, the third presentation analyzed the legal status and the legislative process of uh, establishing an organization in Vietnam from a comparative point of view, including its legal framework, the, the rise in the constitution, the definition, and the scope of application of the organization. Those uh, who know the history of uh, Vietnam uh, know that the social economic economic development of Vietnam is indeed uh, greatly affected by China and France. So the author choose these two countries as a comparison is very suitable research uh, method to understand the legal issue uh, in in Vietnam. I have two suggestions here. The first is that. Uh, author may find one or two uh, typical example of organization at the to discuss so as to better understand 
the direction and extent of the imprint of these two countries. And second, the authors may add in some discussion whether there are some uh, United States factor of law drawing in creating a uh, Vietnam association. And uh, last uh, but not least, there are many information from the uh, folk presentation about the freedom of, of press. I focus on uh, Myanmar that uncovered the uh, risk of local reporter in Myanmar recently under the military coup seen uh, the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and his government were arrested. Uh, a group of young journalists in Myanmar have spent past couple of weeks do documenting the civilian uh, protect movement against the military coup. The author summarized the motivation of this young reporter and how they go about their reporting. Uh, I, I found that this article presents the problem faced by young reporter in several different places and a more comprehensive uh, understanding of different responses to the curve and difference uh, in different places, especially uh, the mention in the uh, Rohingya gathering uh, Rakhine State. Uh, but from an academic point of view, if the author can make some comparison and sort out some uh, model based on these cases, the contribution will be even greater. And I think the audience are also concerned about the education or the courses that the young reporter have taken to add a suitable rule in reporting news. Uh, this is uh, some of my view and suggestion of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Maxi. Um, first of all, a big uh, thank you to all of you who uh, stay on till the last minute. Uh, especially for those in Singapore. We know it's very late here in Singapore. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the East Asian Institute and also our director, Professor Bert Hoffman, I'd like to thank everyone here for your participation, research, insights, and comments. I think the two-day seminar actually is uh, uh, very fruitful as it looks at the topic of ASEAN-China relations uh, from various perspectives, including his history, politics, economics, uh, investment, trade, education, uh, media, ideology, and most importantly, uh, the perspective of uh, new norms. We all know that actually both powers are rising. Uh, China now is an emerging superpower, while ASEAN is also an emerging economic powerhouse. So since its establishment, actually ASEAN has uh, learned a lot from the European Union in terms of regional integration practices and institutions. So it is still, I think, very important for people here to hear the viewpoints from uh, European countries, in, especially France, on these uh, very timely and important regional uh, issues. So I hope this uh, seminar today actually will enhance our EAI's role as a nexus for academic and policy dialogues uh, between the East and the West. Uh, since when new powers are rising, uh, definitely new norms and rules will come accordingly. So it's very timely for all of us to have dialogue on this topic. Uh, here again, I'd like to thank the French National Center for Scientific Research for the sponsorship and also the support from the French Embassy in Singapore. Merci. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank Elsa and Minghua uh, for their excellent organizing work and all the speakers, admin colleagues, and the participants. So uh, see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Good evening. Bravo. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you.